Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the workshop. Our next session is about to begin. May I request you to kindly mute your microphones and wait as we prepare for the session. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome to yet another sneak peek into our biology and bioengineering summer camp. In this summer camp, we will be exploring the frontiers of biology and bioengineering in the 21st century. From resurrecting the woolly mammoth to understanding dinosaur proteins, modern science has allowed us to explore realms which we never imagined. Let us meet our guest speaker, Dr. George Church, who will be joining us in the summer camp from Harvard University. Dr. Church, often called the father of synthetic biology, is a Robert Winthrop Professor of Genetics at Harvard Medical School and Professor of Health Sciences and Technology at Harvard and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. He leads the synthetic biology group at the Wiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University, where he oversees the directed evolution of molecules, polymers, and whole genomes to create new tools with applications in regenerative medicine and bioproduction of chemicals. He is the director of the U.S. Department of Energy Technology Center and director of the National Institute of Health Center of Excellence in Genomic Science. He is widely recognized for his innovative contributions to genomic science and his many pioneering contributions to chemistry and biomedicine. Back in 1984, he developed the first direct genomic sequencing method, which resulted in the first genome sequence, that of the human pathogen, Helicobacter pylori. Among his recent work at the West Institute is the development of a technology for synthesizing whole genes and engineering whole genomes far faster, more accurate, and less costly than current methods. He has received numerous awards, including the 2011 Bowl Award and the Prize for Achievement in Science from the Franklin Institute and election to the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering. We are really excited to have Dr. Church with us during the summer camp. See you at the summer camp. Till then, stay safe and take care. Hello. Hello, thank you. Great. All right. So uh, we are very glad to see you, uh, Professor Church. And now we request you to share your screen and uh, you know, we can start your lecture. Yeah, so thank you for that introduction. And uh, uh, let me know if, if anything goes wrong. Uh, it looks good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm tasked with uh, presenting recent advances in genomics. And uh, I understand there will be time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, so that there are quite a few topics that I'm not covering. Feel free to ask about those as well. Um, but uh, I have a conflict of interest webpage if you are interested in that. And uh, I'd like to start our conversation about uh, equitable access, making technologies higher quality and lower cost uh, for use worldwide, and then move on to eliminating pathogens and, and, uh, and, and so forth. The idea is that by spending a little money, we can save a lot of money and uh, make uh, a more humane and uh, healthy environment uh, for ourselves. So here's some two categories of progress that have been made. Huge progress in both categories, but I would say there's a significant difference between the two. In category one are things like smallpox, skinny worm, polio, and leprosy, which are either extinct or nearly extinct, and hence are zero dollars to subsequent generations all over the world. Uh, and so that's that, that the modest cost that went into making those uh, 
horrible pathogen is extinct was well worth it. Category two are things that where we've had incremental or exponential improvements in, in water, electricity, education, and via internet and so forth, and telecommunications. Now these exponential technologies, a subset of, of all technologies, but particularly uh, easy to recognize today, but they were very hard uh, to notice um, you know, when I started as a student. And two that, that I've been quite involved in, in addition to, to the computational internet technologies, these two are reading and writing DNA here in, in uh, these two red and blue curves. And they not only went uh, exponentially like Moore's Law for computing, but even faster uh, speed um, and may still be going at, at a, at a uh, faster speed on the, you know, doubling faster than uh, a year. And this mostly, a lot of this change happened around 2004 when um, the slope changed. These are factors of 10 along the y-axis um, where the, the qualities improved maybe five orders of magnitude and the cost by 20 million fold in a very short period of time. And that's, I would say, mainly due to multiplexing, which is being able to mix samples such that they're barcoded at the beginning uh, synthetically and, and or naturally and, and then um, disentangled, demultiplexed de at the end. Um, so it's gone down from $3 billion for a poor genome to $300 for clinically valid diploid, meaning both maternal and paternal components. Um, in addition to the classic now uh, next-gen fluorescent sequencing, which is basically fluorescent microscopy applied to uh, billions of samples, um, there's also increasingly an affordable, um, increasingly affordable and portable uh, version, which is the nanopore, um, which um, uh, has many different forms, um, but, uh, but the most commonly used one is having single-stranded DNA go through a, a pore guided by a helicase or a polymerase. Now here uh, are additional categories, uh, not so much of progress here, but of, of uh, decision making and challenging uh, conventional wisdom uh, cha and challenging changes. And these involve um, uh, the differences between um, intentional changes in species whether they're agricultural or biotech, like uh, species that make uh, insulin uh, in bacteria, human insulin in bacteria, versus invasive or random uh, mutants. They some, somehow sometimes trust the natural processes of producing random mutants uh, more than we do our uh, engineering. And I think that uh, we really should be focusing on outcomes. Uh, same thing as there was a great acceptance of smoking and chemotherapy um, one of those two, inappropriate, um, and less uh, emphasis on uh, prevention and avoidance of, of public health threats. Um, same thing we've observed very recently and tragically, uh, infection has been considered natural, while masks, vaccination, social distancing were not mat natural enough to be 100% adopted, and, and the consequence was uh, millions of deaths worldwide. Um, there, uh, a similar thing happens with inherited disease. Many of these things, we discount uh, risks that are, say, 1%, uh, perceived to be 1% probability, uh, and do not accept it less expensive and more cost-effective things like genetic counseling, um, seat belts in cars, uh, and so forth, climate change. So an example of genetic counseling that, it, that has been very cost-effective um, um, while gene therapy might cost a million dollars a dose, on the same uh, price scale, this might be uh, dozens of dollars uh, for, a, for a lifetime um, insight into what the carrier status was, whether you have one affected gene for a variety of um, very serious genetic diseases like Tay-Sachs, which kills um, children um, by their fourth year of life. And, uh, and so communities that have adopted genetic counseling at, at very low cost, um, preconception, premarital, um, have saved 
um, have more or less eliminated these very serious diseases, um, genetic diseases. Now let's talk about eliminating pathogens. I'm sure that sounds um, challenging. Um, we're going to put it in the context of um, a gene and cell therapies, um, and in particular editing. All of you have heard of editing um, uh, of genomes, but the broadest definition of editing, which has tended to be accepted, is, is not merely the subtraction, which uh, methods like CRISPR uh, allow you to remove a gene functionality, but you can add genes, you can do precise editing, which is different from subtracting or knockout, and then epigenetic editing, you can, you can change the way the genes uh, play out. Um, and, and these uh, various categories of editing, addition, subtraction, precise editing, epigenetics, can be accomplished by transgenics, which is adding, say, missing genes. Um, nucleases are error prone, but a good way to get subtraction. Deaminases, where you change an A to a G or a C to a T, uh, are relatively precise, maybe a few uh, errors near the site of, uh, of modification and some off targets in the case of C to T, um, and so forth. There are many ways of doing this, many practical applications uh, listed at the bottom. Uh, as just examples, many more. Now, specifically using editing for, uh, as an antiviral strategy. Editing evolved uh, in bacteria to be an antiviral strategy against bacterial viruses. Uh, we've adapted it uh, not only to directly target the viral genome, DNA or RNA, as, as occurs natural, naturally uh, in bacteria, but to also uh, to, to take another strategy, which is eliminate the viral entry into the cell. So don't wait until it gets in the cell and then cut its DNA or RNA genome, but block it at the outside by, if you can, removing the receptor. Now, the, here's an example. The CCR5 is a receptor in T cells of the HIV virus. Um, now, you can't all, all, some receptors are essential for the life of the cell or the life of the organism, the human, um, as you can't eliminate all of them, um, but you can sometimes eliminate it from a subset of the cells and then they will survive. And this is in clinical trials now where um, you can use a variety of different nucleases, for example, the zinc finger nuclease is one of the first of these technologies, CRISPR being a more recent one. Here's a CRISPR diagram from one of our early papers. You can also use um, editing to eliminate a different kind of pathogenic uh, disease. This is cancer. Um, cancer has been challenging. M many of the cancer chemotherapies um, are fairly toxic to dividing cells in general, including cells that are dividing for the benefit of the person. Uh, but here's a very promising one where you harness the incredible selectivity of the immune system in a system called CAR T cells, or for chimeric antigen receptor in the T cells of the immune system. You can make these universal, and so we've put in yellow highlighting universal, by um, not just adding in this chimeric antigen receptor, which, which recognizes and, and allows the T cells to attack T cell uh, leukemias and lymphomas, but you can also do multiplex editing, meaning editing more than one gene to eliminate uh, some of the um, less fruitful and dangerous parts of, of putting in a foreign cell into your body. And these including eliminating the T cell receptor and uh, the, the, the ink, uh, histocompatibility locus, which is responsible for graft rejection. And again, the editing can be done with zinc fingers, talons, or CRISPR. All of these have been demonstrated. And you can get, you can edit around three of these five genes, typically, two or three. Uh, is typical. So we're moving up from one gene in the previous slide, which was CCR5 to prevent viral entry, to now two or three genes to help this anti-cancer agent. Now we move up to even higher level of multiplexing, which is 42 genes, um, which can be done now in the germline. So the, the previous two were done somatically as, as a therapy in a subset of T cells. Um, this is germline, so every, and 
principle, every cell in the body can be affected, or you can be uh, have a variety of different cells uh, as, as complicated as developmental biology. And there were many incompatibilities. Uh, so um, organ transplant is something we would like to make uh, considerably less expensive, more precise, more on demand, um, uh, and not requiring uh, a, a great sacrifice of someone who's compatible with you or um, uh, who uh, recently uh, deceased. So um, the incompatibility between animals and humans include three major sugars, which cause an intense rejection of, of the incoming organ, but also clotting factors, the major histocompatibility I already mentioned in the context of universal CAR-T, and other immune functions, um, a diverse set that help make um, the incoming organ compatible with the recipient um, patient. And complement is a part of the, of the blood involved in um, path dealing with pathogens. And finally, and most uh, significantly in a certain way, is uh, the um, safety of organs transplanted into immune-suppressed recipient, which almost all recipients of all organs in the world are immune-suppressed to help um, tolerate the incoming organ. Anyway, if you have um, ev almost every mammal produces uh, endogenous retroviruses, some are more serious than others. In this case, the, the porcine endogenous retroviruses, up to 62 of them built into the genome of every uh, nucleus, of every cell, in every pig in the world, um, those viruses come out of the cells of the organ uh, donated and will replicate in human cells. We, we and others have shown that. So um, we, we, in one editing um, experiment, uh, we eliminated all 62 of those endogenous retroviruses from the genome of pigs, making the first um, pig cells that were ever free of all endogenous retroviruses. And since then, we've done the same thing again in the pig germline, and we now have um, dozens of pigs worldwide that um, have many or all of these um, uh, modifications made, and they, are, they seem to be healthy, and they're being used in uh, preclinical uh, transplant trials uh, in uh, non-human primates. With, with very promising results so far. So these, these papers were uh, initiated uh, by the whole, the whole program was initiated by Lu Han Yang, who was a graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, and is now uh, head of Kihan Biotech and co-founder of eugenesis. Jim Markman is, has led some of the, um, the surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. So, that, so we've gone from one edit to two or three edits, to 42 edits. Now we're going to go up to uh, 321 edits to, to change a, one codon out of the 64 triplet codons that, that, that are the genetic code going from DNA to RNA to protein, changing one of those 64 codon, triplet codons um, to a synonymous codon, meaning it has the same meaning, but it has a different sequence. And once you have it You've changed all instances, all 321 instances around the genome uh, to a synonym. Now you can remove the previously essential apparatus that was required for that codon. The codon we chose was UAG. It's one of the rarest ones, um, making it easier to, to alter. And altering that one codon, that one codon type, 321 places throughout the genome, indicated by these little blue bars in the circle of the genome, um, has three very profound effects. It's not just making a genome for its own sake. It allows us to use new chemistries for many new hundred new amino acids. Um, we can also get bio um, isolation, biocontainment, uh, so that you can't exchange DNA in or out. And, and, and finally, we get multivirus resistance. resistance to almost every virus, uh, soon every virus, um, with, with a few more changes, <clears throat> and this is the work of uh, Mark LaJoy, Dan Mandel, and Millie Ostrov um, over the years. Now here's uh, work from Farron Isaacs, who was also involved in this from the very beginning. Um, 
where, as I said, we changed UAG to UAA as a synonymous stop codon. Um, but the, here's the huge impact that it's had on multiple viruses, multiple virus along the x-axis, um, where the four asterisks and the zeros indicate that we went from an input titer of virus uh, up to a trillion uh, virus particle forming, uh, plaque forming units per milliliter down to zero. And <clears throat> so there's multiple viruses simultaneously. The only thing they really have in common is they all require the machinery, the cell that your cell normally provides for dealing with UAG stop codons, which has been removed from this strain. And we think that this strategy, which, which worked in this industrial microorganism, could work in a variety of uh, other microbes, um, plants, animals, and even human cells used for um, manufacturing or human cells used for cell therapies or transplants. So, um, so just the last example of this multiplex editing, where we started with one edit, two edit, two or three edits, 42 edits, 321 edits. Now, our record for any cell um, happens to be in a human pluripotent stem cell, um, actually from my own body, called PGP1 uh, IPS cells. And these, we, we have now done over 22,000 edits in a single cell, focusing in on um, the line repeat elements, which are of unknown function, um, both negative and positive consequences, and we wanted to explore that functionality, um, which might contribute to um, aging, neurodegeneration, and so forth. And this is the work of Raphael, Corey, and Oscar um, um, using a base editor now, the, uh, a, a A to G uh, edit um, um, targeted to a repetitive element, the line elements. We note that even though computing efficiency, meaning uh, the number of operations you can get per joule of input energy, has improved over the years, it still is very short of the kind of computing uh, that happens at, at biology, which is close to the theoretical limit. Um, an example uh, that is looking promising for uh, bio um, computing it, uh, where we're using now, instead of biology benefiting from silicon-based computers, it's um, biology becoming part of the computing solution itself, where you can store around 400 times 10 to the 18th bytes of information in a gram of DNA. Um, we, we demonstrated this 2012 by storing a book in, and making 70 billion copies of it. But, but more recently, we've, we've emulated a flight recorder where you record all kinds of things about um, a body during development or during uh, adult life and store that in, in compact form in DNA. So we've stored now four trillion bits of information in each, it's distributed over each cell of the 30 gram mouse. So 30 nanograms s store 44 trillion bits in it. So one billionth of the mass of the mouse um, stores it, and it's stored via a modified CRISPR system instead of the normal CRISPR system, which where a guide RNA is bound to a protein nuclease and binds its target. Here, its target is itself, so it binds, it, it will cleave and make uh, damage, create new sequences in the middle of its guide RNA gene, and then new guide RNAs are made, and you generate diversity, and that diversity keeps track of developmental biology, or it can also be used to keep track of physiological changes like hypoxia, which has been demonstrated in other laboratories. Um, this is work of Reza Kalhar. Um, and Prashant Mali was also co-inventor of, of CRISPR, and he got, he got back together with us um, to do this methodology. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk about uh, protein and gene um, uh, cellular des design, which uses not just machine learning, which is the, you know, the latest trend in computational biology, but also multiplex testing. I think multiplex testing or machine learning alone is not nearly as powerful as putting together, and we've used this for um, engineering en enzymes, antibodies, editing enzymes like the ones we've talked about before, and regulatory factors like transcription factors. 
Here's an example where we've engineered the capsid used for delivering uh, gene therapies. This is a, a very complex protein design where the, the 30 capsid proteins fit into a icosahedral sphere-like object. Um, we, we had very little input uh, information about this, so we did a systematic survey of all possible point mutations throughout the um, capsid protein and viral genome, and, and then looked for where these mutant capsids would go uh, home, tissue specificity, tissue tropism, um, by dissecting out multiple tissues and doing DNA sequencing of the barcoded uh, viruses. So we could make over a million different viral particle designs, these are not random, uh, and then go through machine learning and do it again. Use what we, we learned from the first round of selection um, to get better and better tissue specificity be or better immune evasion and so forth. And Pierce and Eric published this in 2019 in Form Dino Therapeutics um, to provide this to many other groups. Here's exa some examples of, of um, Eric and Pierce's um, data. Uh, here showing six different tissues, blood, heart, liver, kidney, spleen, lung, and um, uh, different positions along the protein along the x-axis and all the different kinds of codons, uh, amino acids along the y-axis. So you can make all these possible combinations um, and show, uh, the heat map shows in red places where they're better than uh, at that particular tissue than before and blue showing that they're, they've been damaged. But not only can we do every possible point mutation to every, every amino acid to every other amino acid, we can then combine these so we can make multiple changes at once. So rather than having each virus have its own single change, we can have each virus can have up to 29 changes at once. Now normally that would break the protein or break the virus, break the cell. Um, even as few as four mutations simultaneously unguided um, uh, are, are lethal to the protein of the cell. But here we can uh, get up to 29 by using this machine learning, um, using these deep um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, neural nets. Um, and we published four papers on using this kind of uh, um, machine learning on, on proteins recently. We can apply the same kind of um, comprehensive testing of multiple synthetic combinations um, for a variety of epigenetic applications where we can do in vitro um, uh, production of, of, of brain components, of uh, um, a reproductive components. Here's some examples of brain components where oligodendrocytes will wrap the axons and neurons with myelin. So these are two different tissue types that are co-developing from generic stem cells in vitro in, in outside of the body, uh, but then they can be implanted into the brain of a, a, genet a genetic mutant uh, that has uh, <coughs> a neurodegenerative uh, disease and it can rescue it. Um, um, it sort of like this is an analogous to multiple sclerosis. Uh, recent progress in reproductive technologies, including um, at both ends of the, reaper, of the um, embryonic process. This is at the perm at the preemie end, and this is at the implantation end where you have a fertilized egg forming a blastocyst and planting into the endometrial <coughs> cell, decidual cells. We have vascularized tissue. We can, make, we can now differentiate from generic stem cells into vasature capillaries and so on and to many of the components of the brain here or the reproductive system. These, the, both the organs I mentioned earlier, which we can get from animals um, that have been uh, extensively reprogrammed, as well as human cells, um, genetically and epigenetically reprogrammed, can be enhanced. They're not merely um, cell therapy of the organs. Um, they can be pathogen resistant, senescence resistant, cancer uh, immunity, and so on. Um, the, the most, uh, one of the most significant enhancements, be, and partly because it could affect so many people, it could be lower cost because the, co the research and uh, clinical trials can be amortized over a larger population, is anything having to do with aging reversal. And we have a number of examples of this in animals now. Um, 
nine different pathways that we need to coordinate and make sure that they're, we have them all right. Um, here's an example of seven different diseases that have very little in common other than their aging components and uh, three uh, genes that have the property of being, of being secreted out into the, into the rest of the body um, that uh, Noah Davidson uh, pioneered um, um, prior to this PNF paper in 2019, and another three that we published in Nature uh, more recently um, that stay within the cell to which they're introduced. But again, you can solve multiple diseases simultaneously. All they have in common is aging. So maybe we're getting closer to um, aging as a, as a cause and, and as aging as something that can be cost-effectively delivered. So I'm going to... Uh, in there, uh, open it up for questions. I have additional slides if, uh, if the right question is asked. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here um, so we can have a conversation. Great. Uh, Mr. Church, I think, you know, a wonderful work done by your group. And it's really, you know, outstanding to see how much progress has been already made in synthetic biology area. And I think the way your team has done so much, uh, you know, progress it's really remarkable to see, like, you know, moving from very few, uh, uh, you know, changes and then reaching out to almost now you have reached 2000 level, you know, for doing all the 22,000 or so edits. That is really remarkable. Uh, so uh, I'm sure while, you know, many students are very fascinated with all your work, uh, but I'm sure some of them have also curiosity to know that regarding the DNA storage device uh, in the technique which you have developed, uh, how you foresee that going to uh, reach out to market and, uh, you know, uh, in which way people can start using that? Well, uh, so it, 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 it's a little hard to predict. Uh, one possibility is in the organs that we will be delivering is the organs will have these recording devices built into them. So if they fail, we see the mode of their failure. If they're exposed to environmental toxins or, or infectious agents, that, will be, that could be recorded. Um, because the organs that are being, uh, or, or the cell therapies that are be being delivered, um, we want them to, uh, to have a, a low-cost way of, uh, uh, of being able to be debugged uh, going forward. So that, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that they will be used in environmental and agricultural uses initially and then um, migrate into clinical use later. Great. So now let's open it up for the questions from the participants. So let's first start with Argyo Energy. Please unmute and ask your question. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful lecture. I needed to ask one thing, like you, you uh, did the designing of the genes, you applied the AV, AAV therapy on the organs, and after that you taken out the lineages. And after the, uh, further, the studies have also been done on the aging and all these criteria. Like, uh, as a researcher, I would like to ask, like, whether that kind of studies have been done in the organ level. Like, have you taken the particular organs which we were, which you have been studying and looked at their subcellular components? Because uh, the human, like, if you go to the subcellular components, whatever the reflection it gives, that only gives the actual result rather than the whole tissue or the organ. Like, if that kind of validation studies have been done. Uh, yes, uh, I, <clears throat> I, I had a few slides at the end that, that, that didn't fit in the time, but we have a, uh, a new microscopy method that allows us to do uh, DNA, RNA, and protein at the subcellular level, meaning as, as high resolution as 20 nanometers. Um, so the, um, so this having, it's, it's like next-gen sequencing where each molecule, uh, each pixel or voxel in a three-dimensional image, um, it has its own barcode tag. Uh, and so we know which DNA, RNA, or protein is present there. And so we can compare two tissues, either say pathological and normal or synthetic and normal, and see if there are any um, differences, either dramatic or, or subtle. Uh, it's early days in that, but I think that is uh, extremely enabling technology that, that we're using for um, for studying the subcellular. So your point is very, 
um, very good is that we, we do have to. Um, and sir, how much focus. accurate is this microscopy level? Can that be related to the functional level at subcellular level? It, uh, the best way of connecting it functionally, yes, it can be is, a sim is the answer. Uh, the best way we've done that is by perturbing the function intentionally with editing, uh, either epigenetic or genetic ep editing of, of one thing at a time or maybe a small number of, of genes or epigenetic uh, components. And then, then looking at the sub multicellular and subcellular level, so we can do the multicellular at subcellular resolution. So it's that combination of precise perturbation where everything else is held constant um, and the high resolution with high specificity where we really know what's going on at each pixel or voxel. Good questions. Two good Thank questions. You. Yeah. Dija, you want to ask a question? Please unmute yourself. Hello, sir. I'm Dvija. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask a very small question that uh, can gene therapy or editing these fewer known genes stop senescence? Um, so uh, the answer is uh, so far, yes. So we've, we've published uh, three studies in mice um, where, where we've shown that com various combinations of three genes, well, we've looked through about 45 genes at in gene therapy, settled on three, which in various combinations will uh, handle most of the seven diseases that I mentioned. Uh, those, those studies have now been uh, translated into dogs, uh, which have a, um, a veterinary application, and then soon we will be starting to do them in human clinical trials. Um, but the, the, the hypothesis we're testing, and it seems to look very promising, is that a small number of genes can be, whether they're natural or, 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 or more pharmacological, they can be used as uh, major um, controls uh, that we can alter intentionally uh, to reverse aging. Um, so that, so that, um, that one set that are secreted um, and another set that are, that are not, uh, that are to, that both of which have been shown in mice to cause uh, aging reversal and or disease reversal. Thank you so much, sir. All right, we have a couple of questions in the chat here. Uh, one student, Yash Singh, he want to know that whether gene editing could be used to make designer humans where we can select the qualities like increased level of brain functioning or muscular capacity. I'm sure you have a lot of fiction questions here. Yeah, sure. Uh, so. Um, we are altering humans with gene therapy somatically, meaning that we are um, <clears throat> making humans that are, you know, where their T cells are resistant to HIV. I showed that example as an early example. Um, so that is an, an enhancement, uh, just like vaccines are an enhancement relative to our ancestor. Um, vaccines are also a kind of gene therapy uh, um, that is very effective um, and can and can uh, last a lifetime. Um, I think we're holding off on uh, affecting future lifetimes uh, other than indirectly through things like ex making extinct uh, uh, um, uh, pathogenic species. That, that does affect future generations, but not via the germline. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, the enhancements are, almost all of our major technologies are some kind of enhancement in, to the welfare of the of human beings. Great, uh, Shishti Keshri, you want to ask a question? Unmute yourself. Good evening, sir. Uh, so my question is, sir, uh, how, what method, uh, methodologies we can use uh, to activate that telomeres, uh, the, the closed telomere after a certain age, uh, so to stop senses, how can we just, uh, the technologies we can use to, uh, means uh, uh, it, so it, it will be like differentiating a uh, lifetime, so that telomere. 
So uh, telomeres are an example. I, remember, I divided it into two categories, uh, genes that are secreted and affect uh, a larger set of uh, cells than the ones that they were delivered to, and then ones that are cell autonomous. So this, the ones that stay in the cells into which they're delivered uh, include the OSK, which are the three of the components that are involved in reprogramming stem cells, and telomer telomerase uh, genes. Um, uh, it's hard to deliver to every cell in the body, and so these, so these um, methodologies like uh, uh, adding telomerase uh, are both uh, a little dangerous in that telomerase is associated with cancer as well as uh, uh, longevity, uh, but they can be regulated, but they also have to be delivered, so they have a major delivery issue. That's why we tend to go for the, the treatments that are non-cell autonomous, meaning they can spread out from the cell to which they were delivered. All right, next question from Purvaja, Ganesh. Yeah, so can we change physical properties like appearance, whom we look like using gene editing? Well, we can certainly change appearance uh, by something that's less expensive than gene editing, which is cosmetics and uh, wigs and so on. Uh, I, would, I would say that uh, there is not sufficient justification for changing appearance just yet uh, because of the high cost and, and small medical risk that is involved. Uh, I would stick to uh, cosmetics for now. And masks. You can have very beautiful masks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, one question from the chat in the meantime from Arup. Uh, in context of current pandemic, can we design pan-corona viral antigens using synthetic biology approach to design vaccines, which could work for future viruses? Um, so there, there, there are efforts to make, uh, to focus on the non-variable parts of influenza virus and coronavirus. Um, my close uh, colleague and friend, David Baker's group has, has done this for, for, for influenza virus and uh, efforts in my group, uh, for example, with uh, Pranam Chatterjee and so forth have, have um, looked at the potential of targeting the, the functional core of, uh, of, that are conserved in one or more proteins. Um, I, I mean, this is, this is challenging, uh, but it is possible. Uh, doing it for multiple viruses will probably involve multiple solutions, but at least getting one solution for every major category of virus would be uh, a tremendous breakthrough, so we wouldn't have to bring out a separate uh, one for each um, uh, each new wave, each each seasonal um, variation. Um, the, I did describe a strategy w which we could make it, uh, cells resistant to all viruses in principle, uh, but that has much further to go than making these um, these more universal vaccines. Wait, just I'll uh, take one curious question from a participant. He is asking you to share your insights uh, that, you know, while developing the CRISPR technology and also Human Genome Project, what was your experience? He just wanted to listen from you. Uh, yeah, that's hard to, to, to say <laughs> briefly. Uh, they were both very moving, personally moving experiences, uh, partly um, being part of a community, uh, uh, people within my lab and, and uh, multiple other labs. Uh, so that was, that was very moving. Uh, seeing it, uh, them not just slowly, but quickly make their way into practice, both research, agriculture, and biomedical use, um, uh, also was very humbling and, and um, caused, caused one to pause to reflect on uh, on the implications, um, and and finally, uh, the, the the component of um, assuring uh, safety, efficacy, and equitable distribution, sort of the ethical components, are always in one's mind when one's, when one's dealing with powerful technologies. Even if a powerful technology is almost certainly um, of uh, positive uh, medical and agricultural use. You, you still have to think about all the ways that it could uh, go wrong or not uh, be adequately um, priced. 
Uh, so anyway, th those are some of my personal experiences. Thank you for asking. <laughs> That's great. Uh, one more uh, question is that what is your opinion on off-site mutations that can potentially lead to disease like cancer, if a letter phrase? Right. So off-site mutations are, are generally not important unless they lead to something pathogenic that, that is proliferative. In other words, where because they're so rare, they, they need the proliferation to expand to have a physiological effect. But the, but the proliferation is important. The, the, uh, the best uh, editing methods that where, you've test, you, where you've used a computer to avoid um, mayhem and then you've empirically tested, in other words, you, you've tried out a number of different variations on your therapy and picked the one that has the best safety profile. Those are so low off target that they are actually lower than spontaneous mutation rate. So all of our cells are mutating all the time anyway, um, but you can get down below that level. Um, there are some promising methods that have higher off targets. So for example, the C base editor going from C to T um, does, does have higher off target than, than some of the best uh, CRISPR methods. Um, but I think that all of these things are <clears throat> improve, prove, improvable and are improving at a very fast rate. But I, I would say the best methods are, are already uh, quite adequate and are, and are being approved uh, by the um, Food and Drug Administration and equivalent organizations internationally. Arghi Banerjee, you want to ask one more question? Yes, I want to ask one more question. Suppose while designing the study, you are getting a group of genes, okay, which you are targeting and you know that that genes are related to the neurogenitive diseases or some kind of other diseases. But uh, means if we go to some clinicians or some uh, means uh, physiologists, they will see that, okay, how can we relate these findings if the person is having some uh, improper balance or walking problem or whether uh, they are showing some uh, features which is related to brain, like uh, it is very difficult to correlate directly these genes to that kind of human anatomy, how these kind of approaches can be done? Um, yes, that's true. It is <clears throat> not trivial to, uh, to uh, assure safety and efficacy. That's the reason that you do uh, um, animal trials and, and restricted human uh, safety tr trials before you move on to larger populations. Um, but it's, it's no harder to do it genetically than it is to do it uh, with small molecules. And indeed, many small molecules were discovered completely serendipitously. You just screen a big library of compounds, maybe 100,000 compounds, to see which of them have an effect on neural tissue, and then you try it in animals and see what effects they have. So that's totally trial and error. While with genes, at least, you're, you're being guided by the deep knowledge that we have about all the genetic pathways in, in neural systems and off-target systems. Um, so it's, it's not easy, but it is, I think, easier and safer and more predictable than ever before. And I think that's a, hopefully an exponential curve of, of quality assurance. All right, Mahim Dawei, you want to ask a question? Please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Sir, recently scientists have engineered mosquitoes that resist uh, malarial parasite to grow. So what can be the cons of it when we are messing with the, um, you know, general functioning of the ecosystem? Because it is a natural process that host transfers various parasites to, sorry, vectors transport various parasites to host. So what, so how good is the idea of uh, engineered mosquitoes to reduce the endemic and where, and how good would be the idea where we are um, messing with the ecosystem entirely? Uh, because yeah, these are, these are, uh, uh deserve more time than we have uh, to, to answer. Um, <clears throat> but I can say that uh, malaria, uh, so the malaria, if, if we had a good vaccine or, or a, a, a good a effective drug that which the parasite did not become resistant fairly quickly, um, or some other public health measure, then we wouldn't be have we wouldn't be pursuing this. 
Um, engineering mosquitoes is uh, the the uh, ecologists that have weighed in on this seem to imply that even if the if a particular species there's 3,500 species of mosquitoes, even if one of them disappeared completely, it would probably not have an impact on the pollination or the insect eating birds um, because there are many other insects that, that overlap in those ecological niches. That should be uh, pursued and confirmed by additional uh, e ecological studies that are aimed specifically at the species we might want to get rid of. So in India that would be um, Anopheles, uh, uh, not, not Gambia, Stevensii, Stevensii, but the Gambia and Stevensii probably could be eliminated without impacting the ecology. But you don't have to eliminate them, you just make them malaria resistant. The, the, the gene drive method won't, won't uh, seems to, from uh, experiments so far, will not spread to, into distantly related insects. It will stay in the species that you targeted for uh, a variety of reasons because the way you've designed uh, the nucleic acids. But all of this has to go through the kind of safety and testing that, that we do for, for drugs in the FDA and for uh, other environmental factors in the United States and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. So it should get a lot of scrutiny, a lot of discussion, and a lot of good questions like yours. So uh, there's a lot of questions still coming up, but we'll just take one last question from uh, participants. So Shalini, you want to unmute and ask the question? Hello. Hi, sir. So my name is Shalini, and I have two questions, basically. One is related to the genetic editing whenever we are doing. There are, relate, like, there are issues with the fertility of the cells or the organisms, whichever we are doing. So how... How are you uh, taking care of that part? And also the second thing, when we are doing the editing related to any organism, then there are, like just you mentioned related to anti-aging, then there are other factors which, which are such as accumulation of the uh, byproducts due to the aging of the cells. When a cell goes through a life cycle, they also have some accumulations of the byproducts which judge about their uh, life of the cell. So how are you taking care of those byproducts so that it's not harmful for the cell which is prolonged? Uh, right, so there, um, there's evidence that young cells deal with those byproducts quite, quite m a lot more effectively than old cells. Uh, so if you, and if you take an old cell, you know, very old, say 80 or 90 year old uh, cell, you can restore it to embryonic state using the Yamanaka transcription factors, uh, OSKM, uh, and, and then now the cell becomes better at dealing with uh, all the metabolic uh, issues uh, of day-to-day -day life, much better than the older cell from which it was derived. So you can go back and forth in, <coughs> in uh, senescence <coughs> and developmental space uh, using these four factors and other transcription factors, uh, which indicates that the problem is not the accumulation of toxic materials, it's the loss of uh, repair processes that are, is epigenetically programmed into old cells versus young cells. Uh, and I think the same thing goes to your first question, first half of your question, which has to do with reproductive uh, components. Many of the, the decay in reproductive components is also related to what age the cell thinks it is, if I can use a metaphor. If the cell thinks that it's young, it will have uh, a lower frequency of non-disjunction, which is a, a major reason for uh, um, miscarriages uh, and um, uh, genetic uh, problems. Um, so so that, that non-disjunction where you get unequal numbers of chromosomes being uh, separated um, is, a, is a symptom of, uh, of the epigenetic change, which, can, which we think now we can go back and forth in, in time effectively or in developmental stage. Um, right. So we have here, you know, it looks like uh, participants are so much engrossed with uh, your talk that they are not wanting you to finish, you know, but we have to still close. Let's take this one last hand, which is the raised here, Kumar Vishal, and then I think we will close. 
Vishal, you want to unmute and ask a question quickly? Uh, hello, good, uh, good evening, all of you. Sir, I have a one question that uh, can be used CRISPR Cas9 with the use of uh, AVV vectors to uh, genetically modify the uh, spermatogonial stem cells in a mouse or in a big animals that can be useful for generating, uh, gene editing offsprings further that will be very useful in agriculture and uh, uh, further uh, genetically modified. Other than we uh, edit the, uh, uh, the stem cells of an, a female, we can use them to edit the uh, sperms so that they can uh, uh, generate offsprings of genetic modified. Yeah, so I think right now uh, um, the modification of germline, including sperm cells, it could, it could help with infertility, um, but there are other solutions that are being pursued for infertility that don't involve changing the, the DNA of the germ cells. Um, and there, there's just very few bona fide medical problems that, that uh, can only be addressed by uh, engineering the spermatogonial cells or the oocytes. Um, but there are things that can be done epigenetically where you don't change the, the DNA, you're changing the way that it plays out, and we're pursuing some of those to, to help with um, uh, fertility issues and uh, age-related issues that we mentioned in the previous uh, Q&A. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mr. Church, for this wonderful lecture and, uh, you know, making queries for a lot of enthusiastic uh, participants here. So on behalf of our organizing committee from IT Bombay and uh, the entire summer camp, we are very thankful that you spared the time and shared your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all and, and good, good fortune on all your uh, research and studies. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. You too.